All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach a wider audience and educate more people on Bitcoin together with my guests. And in this episode, I'm joined by Sam Lyman. He's a public policy director at Riot Platforms, a leading Bitcoin mining company and a contributor to Forbes. He previously served as the policy director of a DC-based think tank and as a speechwriter to the president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and a U.S. senator. His graduate research at Princeton focused on the impact of emerging technologies on in international relations, and Sam believes a decentralized future is essential to freedom and human flourishing. So uh, I'm excited to talk with him today. Welcome, man. Yeah, Bram, great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I think it's great timing with... Uh, the announcements we saw at uh, at the Bitcoin conference in in Nashville, I think, fun topic to talk about global game theory and uh, Bitcoin as a uh, reserve asset. But before we dive into that big topic, I'd love to hear your Bitcoin story. How did you get into Bitcoin? Yeah, I first heard of Bitcoin. I think it was 2013. I was watching an episode of Conan O'Brien's Late Night Show where they were making Bitcoin jokes. And it piqued my curiosity and I started to do some research and looked into what Bitcoin was, didn't really grasp it at the time. And I honestly didn't think much of it. Um, it wasn't until later on, a few years later, I was working in the U.S. Senate. I was working for Senator Hatch. And this was the bull run of 2017 when Bitcoin was touching $20,000 around that range. And I had a coworker who came down sweating and nervous because he was thinking, I bought Bitcoin, should I sell? And I said, what's it at? He said, $20,000. And I was shocked because, you know, last time I checked a year prior, Bitcoin was you know, much lower than that. And so uh, that piqued my curiosity even more. And uh, when I started working at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, it was very, some of the policies we worked on there were cryptocurrency adjacent. And I started to get more and more interested in it. It wasn't really, though, until 2020, 2021, that I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole uh, during that bull run. And just once you go down that rabbit hole, you don't really emerge. And especially in the wake of COVID, there was such severe inflation that it really opened my eyes up to the need for some kind of currency or some kind of hedge against fiat currency. Uh, fiat currency, as history shows, is unsustainable over time. And I could foresee a future where we once again peg our currency to something uh, of lasting value, whether it be gold or Bitcoin or a basket of commodities. And so I started to do a lot of research into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, coincidentally, when I was at grad school at Princeton. And a lot of my research there focused on cryptocurrency policy. Um, it's sort of a niche in the policy market that was just waiting to be filled. And so a lot of my papers at grad school focused on how can we leverage digital assets like Bitcoin, stable coins, um, and other digital assets as instruments of economic statecraft. And a lot of the research I did, uh, I then repurposed into op-eds and in leading publications like Fortune and Forbes, uh, later got the invite from Forbes to be a digital assets contributor. And that's when I got on Riot's radar and began working full-time in the industry a while ago. And it's been a blast. I mean, it's amazing to turn a hobby into a full-time job and to educate and evangelize lawmakers on Bitcoin is honestly a dream come true in many ways. I mean, this is such a, a truly world-changing technology, and I think yeah. it shifts people's paradigm on what money is and what it should be and what it can be. Um, and yeah, that's more or less my journey into Bitcoin. Here I am today. Love that, man. I love, in in general, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people now, and a, lo a lot of people have had the same experience as you, whereas they... They had a touch point with Bitcoin at, you know, price X, Y, Z. And then they didn't really think much of it. And then later they had another touch point. And then they realized that A, it was still there. And B, it was up tenfold or twentyfold, you know. And that piqued a lot of curiosity in people. And I, I think it's so interesting to hear you have a, a, a similar a similar story there. Can you remember when you found it and you kind of dismissed it? Was there any belief that made you like not get into it or was it just like some short touch point or like how, how did, how did that go? Yeah, 
Um, when I first discovered it was during an episode of Conan O'Brien's late night show where it was the butt of a joke. It was the punchline, right? Yeah. And so at that time I figured, oh, well, if they're joking about this on a late night TV show, then this must not be real. But interestingly, it was after the late night TV show where it was the punchline that I started to look into it and realize, no, there's some real technology here. And I didn't have the wherewithal at the time to go deeper. Um, you know, I was a poor college student <laughs> and, and I figured, oh, well, I probably don't have enough money to buy it anyways, as everybody does. I, I deeply regret that. But I think I could sense even from an early stage that this was technology that was real. And even though I couldn't grasp it at the time, um, I noticed that there was a lot of, as Donald Trump would say, high IQ people who were into <laughs> Bitcoin. And so I deferred to them. Um, yeah. And I, I think it wasn't really accessible to the casual retail investor until the Coinbases of the world came along. And I think that made it a lot easier to, of course, acquire Bitcoin, but also mainstreamed it in a way that you had a lot of Bitcoin educators who were starting to rise to the surface. Um, people like Safety and Amos, um, Pierre Richard, uh, a lot of people in the Bitcoin space who are just really good at explaining what Bitcoin is. Uh, that's when I first started to really understand what is the technology behind this, uh, Bitcoin itself is an education in so many different fields, politics, economics, social psychology, international relations, that once you get a small taste of Bitcoin, it's an incredible education across uh, so many different fields of knowledge that it's hard, it's hard to look away after that. Um, so I'd say, yeah, 2013 during that episode of Conan O'Brien show, that's when I first heard of it and dismissed it. 2017 is when I really started to take it more seriously when I had a coworker who bought some and, you know, I was at the peak of the bull market. And I'd say I didn't really start to take it seriously and recognize its utility as an instrument of economic statecraft until probably 2020 or 2021. Yeah. So how deep does the rabbit hole go in your case? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in my case... I don't know if there's any bottom to the rabbit hole. I think it just keeps going further and further. And the longer you spend in the field, the more you realize that the <laughs> who knows where the rabbit hole ends. I mean, even the greatest experts in Bitcoin seem to discover more and more about it. And um, yeah, yeah, it just keeps going, in my opinion. Yeah, I have a similar experience. I think more maybe my question was, what what's the biggest insight that you discovered in, in that rabbit hole that, that, that like shook your world a bit. Yeah. I think someone once told me that if you don't understand Bitcoin, you don't understand money. And I think that's fundamentally true. I think a lot of people dismiss it because fiat currency is the water that they've been swimming in their whole lives. There's a story that I really like, um, it's sort of a parable where there's two fish that are swimming in the ocean and they pass a much older fish. And the older fish says to the two fish, how's the water boys? And the two younger fish swim away and they say, it's good. But then they swim away and they ask, what the heck is water? <laughs> <laughs> so the whole metaphor being that Love the that. fish, even though water is what they've been swimming and living in their whole lives, uh, they still don't really know what water is. They can't grasp it. They're too close to it. I think there's a good metaphor there for fiat currency and the U.S. dollar system, uh, because people take for granted that you know we have the U.S. dollar or whatever fiat currency you use depending on what country you live in, and people just accept that that is money, and they don't consider that there are superior forms of money out there. Uh, Bitcoin, in my opinion, being foremost among them. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin needs to scale, and there's still some obstacles before it can become a medium of exchange, unit of account, and store of value, and all those. Uh, properties that make money what it is today. But I, I think that's the biggest revelation to me is that once you understand what Bitcoin is, you can't look at money itself in the same way ever again. Mm. And money underpins everything we do in our society from politics to economics to business. And once you realize that the money we're using is potentially flawed, it kind of shifts your whole view of society. <laughs> and that's why I think Bitcoiners might have a tinfoil hat reputation sometimes. Uh, but it really is because they've gone to the other side and they can now see on the horizon a better world uh, that can potentially be made by embracing a currency that uh, is scarce, that is finite, that uh, appreciates in value over time as opposed to depreciates like our fiat currency, which has a tendency to inflate over time. 
Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building and to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree. I, I think it was the same for me. And also even on my podcast, I, I talked to people who are like master, they have a master's in economics, right? And and they told me, I never learned what money is. And I think once you realize that even those people don't learn and you are participating in a system, right? You're swimming in, in the water, as you said, and you have no no clue how it works. You know, once you realize how it works, then you have like this pivotal kind of like decision point, right? Like, do I go with this new information and new truth, right? Or observation, or do I stay in, you know, this old paradigm that I don't understand, but it's, it's easier, right? I think for many people that has been like the kick down the rabbit hole, because as you said, like everything eventually, you know, is downstream from from the money, I, I say that all the time. Like if you identify as a progressive person and you want to fix everything in the world, then you have to realize that everything that you would ever want to fix uh, is broken because the money is broken, because it, it, it breaks incentives and makes people do things that are perhaps not in their own best interest or in the interest of the people that they want to serve. And I think, at least for me, that was one of the biggest, like hard hitting things to realize, right? Like that, no, not everyone has the right incentives to do the right things, although we all talk about it. Yeah, Ram, that, that's so well put. And everything you just described reminded me of the scene from The Matrix when uh, Neo is offered the, the red pill or the blue pill, right? Exactly. And the blue pill is fiat currency, fiat world, you know? Take the blue pill and you can stay in sort of this fantasy land that you've been living in where slowly over time your savings erode, everything gets more expensive, but you just accept reality as it is. But then, of course, there's also the red pillars, like we like to say in the Bitcoin community, the orange pill. And once you take that, you really do see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Yeah. I also always, I, I love the matrix in this example, right? I also think about the guy who double crosses them, right? Who was like, I like the steak. I want to keep eating the steak, he says, right? And I think that's the person who realizes there's another paradigm, but they are... I don't want to say strong enough, but they, they are too comfortable in the old paradigm basically. And they, they want to eat the steak, although they, although they know that the steak is not real and their mind is playing tricks on them. Right. I, I think this is kind of like the biggest mental hurdle that people need to get over is that, um, actually like yesterday or day before yesterday, I saw a tweet where it said the dollar lost, I think it was 20% or even 25% of its purchasing power in the last four years. Yeah. Wild, you know, uh, but not that many people wake up to that, you know, like it, I find it crazy. I think in, uh, 
in the uh, euro in the euro area or in my country it, it's also about like 18 percent or something yeah it it's just crazy but there's there's no one in the street protesting against the money right like it's, it's sometimes at least for me it feels like are we the only people trying to do something about this or like how how do you see that you know like so not talking like actually moving moving to a new new system yeah i think now is prime time to orange pill people because of those conditions that you described um people are feeling the pinch every time that they go to the grocery store every time they pay their rent every time they fill up their car with gas uh, people are definitely recognizing that inflation is much worse than it's ever been in their lifetimes. And I think more people are asking questions as to why they're waking up to the effects of um, the Federal Reserve's monetary policy and Congress's reckless spending, recognizing that this is having a really tangible effect on their lives, that effectively the government is exacting a stealth tax in the form of inflation that they didn't sign off on. And that I believe gives them an opportunity to consider alternatives, Bitcoin being the foremost among them. Um, just to pull out a different statistic, you know, over the last 10 years, the U.S. dollar has depreciated uh, in terms of purchasing value by about 30%, whereas Bitcoin has appreciated in value by 5,000%. And so when you put things in context for people who are worried about their savings, they start to catch on to this narrative that Bitcoin isn't some wild-eyed financial experiment, but potentially the most effective savings instrument that we have on the market today. And so it seems like there is a correlation between inflation and people becoming more and more open to Bitcoin. And that gives me hope, honestly. Um, and I think it also keeps the U.S. government in check or will over time. Uh, effectively, Bitcoin can serve as a check on reckless money printing from central banks because yes. people can opt into Bitcoin if they feel like uh, their savings aren't secure in their own currency in their own savings accounts. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent agree. I I always well maybe we'll get there eventually, but I I I was a pretty fierce uh, proponent of you know um, legal tender. It has be has to become the money, hyper bitcoinization, all all these things, right? I I think eventually we will get there, but the phase in between is more like this is a competitor to the fiat money. And exactly as you said, because that exists and because people can move, it will keep, or at least attempt to keep, you know, the fiat money in check because there is a competitor that's completely, you know, 180 degrees different than, you know, the fiat, the fiat money. And so I think it kind of serves as like checks and balances type, type thing. You know, it could, it could be the, um, I don't know, kind of like there's a new measuring stick in town, you know, and if you measure in that measuring stick, then you can buy way more with the units of Bitcoin that you have versus the units of dollars or, you know, any other fiat money that you have. So I went from that part of maximalism more towards what you just mentioned. And I think that will be great, but I, but also, and that's one of the things I want to talk uh, with you about as well, like the, that, that, that freedom of choosing the money or increasing the competition of money, that is of course not a smart decision by the people in charge of the old money, right? So do you think they would ever allow that or is manifesting Bitcoin a more rebellious thing? It depends on the country, I think. Um, I would also say it might not be a question of whether countries allow it. It might be a question of whether they recognize that it could be the only thing that can save them from hyperinflation. So yeah. over the weekend, we had uh, a history making speech from President Donald Trump, where he announced Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset. And he very wisely pointed out that Bitcoin itself is not a threat to the dollar. The U.S. government's feckless and reckless money spending, that's the true threat to the value of the US dollar over time. And so by announcing a strategic reserve asset, I think that indirectly strengthens the dollar actually in a number of ways. Uh, number one, it gives people confidence. Let's project this experiment out 10 years from now. Um, and let's suppose that Bitcoin over the next decade achieves parity with gold 
which if that were to happen today, I think it would put each Bitcoin at around seven hundred thousand dollars. You know, who knows how how much that would be a decade from now? Let's just say a million dollars. I feel like that's a pretty conservative estimate of where Bitcoin could be a decade from now if the thesis plays out. Well, if the United States acquired five percent of the world's Bitcoin supply, as Senator Cynthia Lummis aims to do with her new bill um, that would essentially build a Fort Nakamoto, uh, a Bitcoin reserve for the United States. Well, that definitely strengthens the dollar because it gives people the confidence that in the event of hyperinflation, there is a hard asset that the United States government has to fall back on if it ever needs to, to peg its currency to um, a tangible asset in the future. And I also think that Bitcoin plays this really interesting role where if the dollar were ever to be pegged to something real in the future, as it was under the gold standard, um, Bitcoin could potentially save the U.S. dollar. And it, maybe this is a pie in the sky scenario, but with the rate of inflation as it is today, I don't think it is. You have a number of really prominent policymakers from RFK Jr. to Vivek Ramaswamy, who's actually advising Trump on Bitcoin and digital assets. Uh, both of those policymakers have come out and proposed this idea of backing the dollar with a basket of commodities that could include Bitcoin. So it reminds me of those stages of a revolution. You know, first they laugh at you, uh, then they fight you, and then you win. I think we actually might be moving from the fight stage to the mm -hmm. winning stage. I don't want to count my eggs before they hatch. But I think more and more government um, is waking up to the fact that their own spending uh, is unsustainable. Their fiat currency has a shelf life. And if it's not backed by something scarce and finite like Bitcoin in the future or a basket of commodities to go along with it, their fiat currency will go the way of the dinosaur. So I actually think that that question itself is evolving to, from, you know, will governments try to ban it to will governments recognize the way that this could actually benefit them and help save their own currencies? Yeah. Well, this, of course, this is, of course, part of the, the intricacies of the game theory, right? Like the game theory has multiple dimensions. I think this is one of them, you know, right? Like if you, if you go through it in a, in a sequential way, it's kind of like, okay, this thing exists. It's decentralized, so it's not going anywhere. Do we want to shut off the internet? No, probably not. Do we want to do a 51% attack that costs us, I don't know, I, I once saw this calculation, right? 10 billion for 10 minutes or something like that. Wow. You know, probably not. Okay. So in what way is it a, a threat to us? Well, you know, I think we just mentioned it before because it's so ultimately transparent and fiat money is not, it's it's a great competitor. So do you ignore it? Do you accept it? Allow it? Whatever, right? Like, I, I think it's these little little steps. What I like is the thought that, you know, it's it's better adopting it than fighting it. And that's kind of the main thing I'm 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 looking at, you know, in terms of are we winning or, you know, what is the what is the shift that is taking place? I think we went from Elizabeth Warren is building an anti crypto army, you know, and what, what did she tweet last week? Like Chinese or foreign miners are interfering with or something. So I don't know. Just some you know, it, it's such a big tell when they talk uh, in terms of fear, right? Um, sure. Because the other side of it, the positivity side of it is way more, way, way, way more interesting, as you mentioned, right? Like it could help solve an unpayable amount of debt. Um, it could resolve the debt spiral, all, all these things. And so I'm kind of looking at how is the, I don't want to say that what's the vibe shift, right? From... Um, anti to, to pro and, and then in, in whatever way, right? Because I think we, th there's so many things that we'll talk about that, but there's so many things we would love to see that obviously were not announced by, um, by Trump or RFK, uh, or even, uh, Cynthia Lamas, uh, US Senator who announced a bill to make it all happen or already, right? It's more a signal. It's more a signal of going from, you know, anti to, to pro whatever the, appliances are right now. I, I, I don't know if that really matters, but yeah, wh what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head when you described a vibe shift. Um, having been in the world of crypto policy over the last year, I've definitely noticed a shift of tone, both from Republicans and Democrats alike. 
So we talk often of Bitcoin game theory and how that will play out among nation states. Well, it's also playing out in really intriguing ways among politicians. I think we're seeing that in the presidential race right now. Uh, we all know that Donald Trump was very much against Bitcoin before he was for it. And he did a simple political calculation. He recognized that the political upside of embracing Bitcoin is enormous and the political downside um, of rejecting Bitcoin is also something to consider. Uh, so he recognized that this was an investment he could make as a political entrepreneur that had almost infinite upside and very little downside. Um, whereas if someone is against Bitcoin, there's there's no hardly any upside to that whatsoever. If anything, there's more downside because as we know today, uh, crypto super PACs or political action committees are actually uh, fair shake is foremost among them, and it's the largest super PAC in the country right now. So yeah. I don't know what Democratic strategist thought it was a good idea for Elizabeth Warren to make an enemy of a new financial system without considering that there's a lot of money behind that. Yeah. But that person should not be able to keep their job because uh, they've really put the Democrats in a tough bind. And you're seeing that game theory among political individuals play out in real time where Donald Trump has embraced Bitcoin and now Kamala Harris is trying to pivot. Uh, obviously, we know that the Biden administration has been the most hostile administration towards Bitcoin and digital asset companies in American history. And so to pivot now is a little rich and I think comes off as inauthentic and disingenuous in my opinion. But even so, there has been outreach from the Kamala Harris campaign as a way to uh, tamp down on some of the efforts by crypto political organizations uh, to fight against them politically. And so uh, politicians themselves are recognizing that there's no benefit to being against Bitcoin and digital yeah, assets. Exactly. And so I, for that reason alone, I think the future of Bitcoin actually is bipartisan because it's something that um, is of benefit to people on both sides of the aisle. Not to mention from philosophical terms, I, I have you know many progressive friends and I tell them often, you know, as a progressive, you have every reason to be for Bitcoin. It is the democratic money that is available to all people, regardless of color, class, or creed. Um, you know, if I were a progressive myself, I couldn't dream up a better currency in a lab. It's it's perfect, and it has appeals to people on both sides of the aisle. And I think it's just a matter of time before politicians wake up to that. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I I think in general it's really interesting. Maybe it's also a bit different, I think, in Europe, right? But you use the word progressives for more like the leftist uh, side, right, in America. And when I hear the word progressives, I think like you, those are forward thinking people, right? You should embrace new technology or at least look into it or, at least, you know, familiar, uh, familiarize yourself with it to know what it could be, right? But we see the same agony. I don't know if that's the word, but with, with any new technology, right? Like, uh, you know, people who liked uh, 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 swords and bows and arrows, they didn't like gunpowder, right? Then people who liked horses didn't like trains. Like, But I think in this case, as you alluded to before, like the, the money, my money is just the biggest topic that we can tackle or solve so because everything that eventually happens or is created or built or whatever is downstream from you know, the incentives of, of the money we use. And I think that's why some people are just in, in over their head in the beginning. I mean, I, I, I was the same. I don't have an economic or financial background or whatsoever. Right. But, um, and, and we talked about this before, like once you understand what money is and that it's broken and that we need to fix it, you know, it doesn't really matter if you're red or blue or white, black, you know, what, whatever. And I, I personally really love that about Bitcoin, that it's not about all these, uh, I don't want to say superficial, but lesser important things than, you know, what is the technology we use to communicate with each other? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good way of describing it. I mean, Bitcoin transcends political categories. Yeah. I think uh, the one political faction that is inherently against Bitcoin are those who want to expand the power of government and believe in technocracy over democracy. And I think that actually explains Elizabeth Warren's support for Bitcoin, even though she identifies as a progressive. She's made very clear from 
uh, the work that she's done in the Senate in her own political statements that she's pro central bank digital currencies. And she intuits correctly that Bitcoin is an anti CBDC. So she has every incentive to try to outlaw it or to try to drive Bitcoin innovation offshore uh, because she recognizes that that essentially clears the way for a CBDC. And so where we do see some political division, I think it is between those who believe that the government should oversee money and have greater power than it does now. And those who believe that there's a technology that exists to disintermediate the state um, and to separate the state from money to a certain degree, then Bitcoin is a really good solution for that. Yeah. So do you think it's strategic to announce, you know, a Bitcoin reserve asset strategy right now without having actual power to to also do anything right now? I mean, you know, if if there's people in China or any other adversary type countries of America and they think, you know, Trump has the biggest chance to win, he says he's going to do this, you know, we should look into this thing and maybe buy some. What are your thoughts on that? That's a fair question. Is it strategic if you're announcing what your next play is to the opposing team, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, it's a worthy question. My response is, yes, it is, just because of the way policy works in the United States. So th there's really no feasible way that the U.S. Treasury could secretly accumulate Bitcoin. Uh, when it's matters dealing with U.S. finances, there does have to be some kind of democratic process where the people get a say in how their government um, accumulates reserves. And so there's two vehicles for that, uh, executive orders from the White House or legislation from Congress. And we saw um, both of those at play with Trump's announcement over the weekend and then Senator Lummis's announcement as well. What's really interesting about both policy proposals is that they dramatically opened the Overton window in a way that it hasn't before. Uh, to even consider Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset just a year ago, I think to anyone outside of the Bitcoin world sounded like a kooky yeah. yes. idea that would never come to fruition. But as the idea kind of got socialized with time and as more people got educated on what Bitcoin is, what potential benefits it could bring to the United States, they were more uh, warm and welcoming to the idea itself. And now that both a bill has been introduced in Congress and um, President Trump has made it a, pla uh, a platform priority for him, uh, we now know that this is a feasible policy idea. And I think you'll see more conversations from both Democrats and Republicans alike about the issue. And we needed to open the Overton window before we could enact this kind of policy. These things can't really be done in secret. Um, and in that sense, uh, it still is strategic, definitely. And I think so we mentioned earlier, uh, just before we started recording, we talked about uh, there was a legislator in Hong Kong who mentioned that he would uh, potentially propose something similar to what Lummis proposed over the weekend about a strategic reserve asset. And that's all very small scale, of course, but it's drop by drop that these things happen. And, um, you know, if President Trump is elected, that really builds a lot of mom momentum behind Senator Lummis's bill, where this could become an actual policy of the United States government. And at that point, I think it has the same practical effect as the BlackRock ETF where all of a sudden Bitcoin is mainstreamed for Wall Street investors. Once you have a nation state like the United States, the home of global capital, accumulating Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset, that essentially makes Bitcoin mainstream among nation states themselves, where they have a natural incentive knowing that the United States is accumulating it to accumulate it themselves. And it really gets the game theory going into hyperdrive. Yeah, I love I love this nuanced answer because it's also, you know, we are really in a bubble, right? We we I think a lot of people in Bitcoin have already thought about okay, what is the best strategic move for, you know, a a country and, you know, it's so obvious that you need to do it, but I think uh as you just mentioned, you know, it's a, it's the, the policy making has a different pace. Uh I would I would say um, but maybe the biggest signal is broadening the Overton window, ha having even, you know, a Hong Kong type reply w within two days over the weekend, actually, you know, maybe that's already what we should look out for. Right. And maybe that's already, um, enough. Yeah, I, I hope so. And it draws an interesting contrast with Germany 
Um, we know that Germany yeah. sold all of their Bitcoin just a couple of weeks ago. It really <laughs> dipped the Bitcoin price down pretty hard to the low 50,000s and then rebounded very quickly after that. So um, part of me wonders if Germany marked the bottom among nation states by selling all of its Bitcoin stash. And Much if, like uh, it. yeah. yeah, right. And yeah. the United States announcing a strategic reserve is what really catalyzes the next bull run, at least uh, among nation states. So it'll be yeah. fascinating to see how it all plays out. Yeah. Another thing I find really interesting uh, from that proposal of uh, Cynthia Lomas is that she kind of has set the bar for you know, a sovereign strategic reserve, which is 5% of total supply, as she mentioned, right? So she says, okay, we need to get to 1 million Bitcoin. Um, RFK had another approach. He was like, okay, we own 20% of all the dollar or of all the gold in the world. So we should also own 20% of all the Bitcoin in the world. So he proposed 4 million Bitcoin, which I think uh, is, uh, I, I appreciate the idea, but I, I don't know if that's still still doable. But even the million, you know, in five years, she also said, I think that bar, I, I think it's interesting is that she set a bar, but also that it's that million in that time frame. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I thought that RFK's proposal, obviously I liked it as a Bitcoiner, but my first reaction is I worried that it would actually centralize Bitcoin in a way uh, that is dangerous to the Bitcoin network. <laughs> if, if the United States owns 4 million of the world's 21 million Bitcoin, um, that's great for the United States, but I worried about uh, how centralized Bitcoin might become in that situation for the United States. So. I also, and I think RFK is, is a, a great man. I admire him as a, a politician in many ways, but um, I, I think he knew <laughs> that his role in the conference was to anchor uh, in negotiation terms, to set a heavy yeah. anchor for the yeah. other policymakers to try to match, knowing that they probably wouldn't be able to. Mm -hmm. And he also put that forward knowing that it's not super likely that he'll be president. Um, but I admire the the ambition behind this proposal. I do think that Senator Lummis's proposal of one million is much more feasible and really would be give the United States a competitive edge. Um, I like to think of Bitcoin and gold in terms of Netflix and Blockbuster. Uh, I actually think that gold has the potential to be Blockbustered, so to speak, by Bitcoin itself because. Bitcoin is, in a way, startup gold. It's got all the properties of gold, um, but then it has a lot of characteristics that make it a superior form of gold in terms of being more portable, more scarce, uh, much harder to mine, much easier to verify. So it offers um, a lot of the benefits of analog gold, but brings with it certain benefits that make it arguably a much better store of value. Of course, that thesis is yet to play out, but I think the United States or really any nation state should have an interest in accumulating its own strategic reserve, more or less as a call option on the thesis that Bitcoin does one day either achieve parity with gold or even surpass it. Um, just from that perspective alone, I think it makes sense for countries to own at least a little bit of Bitcoin in the same way that it makes sense for individual investors, um, some might say, to own a little bit of Bitcoin. Of course, I'm not a financial advisor, and that's not financial advice, but I think that's the thesis behind um, a lot of accumulation on an individual level. And I think yeah. pretty soon we'll see that same accumulation among uh, pension funds and companies and eventually nation states. Yeah, I don't think that's a far, far stretch. I mean, having gold is is a, a hedge against the, their own fiat system, right? I think uh, um, at least the central bank in my country has, has set that Literally, you know, we have gold in case um, our money system doesn't survive. But what I find interesting, and I think once that clicks, that's probably far away, but then we will see more of the shift towards Bitcoin is that, you know, why do you have gold? Yeah, I have gold because everyone else has gold. So why does everyone else have gold? Yeah, because, you know, it was used by the Egyptians for, for these amounts of years and blah, blah, blah. Like it's all talk. Right, like it's kind of like someone said it, and then they all they all followed each other. Right, like it it feels like 
And and it's funny. I don't know. Uh, I, I forgot to ask what which, gen- which generation you belong to. But like for me, just thinking about owning gold myself feels so old. Right? Yeah. Like it, it <laughs> feels prehistoric. Like what are you what, what what are you talking about? You know, like why should you own a shiny rock? Not to diss the gold box, whatever. Like do do whatever you want. But at, at least for me, as someone who grew up in you know, first analog, then a digital age, like just holding a shiny rock doesn't make sense for me and holding it because other people say it has value, right? Like it's, it's a story, you know, and I think Bitcoin is, is the, and, and you have to trust in the story of gold, right? And, and the, the don't trust verify, you know, tagline of Bitcoin for me just makes much more sense like should i believe in something because other people say it or should i believe in something or have conviction on something that it could help me because i can verify it for myself right like just just that is for me it's it's just way more rational to have bitcoin like you don't have to believe it like you can verify it right and gold is more of a of a belief type asset yeah that's a good way of putting it like you said you can verify everything on the blockchain it's the most transparent form of money that exists and yeah for the record i i too am a millennial so all right uh, when i saw okay the bitcoin for millennials podcast I'm like that's right that's up my alley <laughs> yeah and, and yeah. i think gold is great and i think you know one advantage of gold over any other i mean i'm not saying it doesn't that, work right but this is better Th- yeah that, that is more the conclusion sorry exactly ahead. exactly yeah i was gonna say gold has the advantage of being lindy so to speak mm-hmm. you know it's been uh proven over time to be a pretty amazing store of value. Um, but I think a lot of gold bugs kind of rest on their laurels sometimes by saying, oh, Bitcoin is a Lindy like gold is. Well, it isn't yet because it's very young still, but it seems like Bitcoin is in its teenage years as a digital or as a financial asset. And we're seeing it, you know, what happens to your teenage years, a growth spurt, right? Yeah. Uh, we can see like a real price accumulation over the next decade that could put it on even terms with gold. And, I, I just love, because I feel the same way as uh, as a millennial. I mean, so much of our lives are lived online that um, I don't enjoy particularly owning physical things. Um, of course, you know, a car, like basic necessities, TV, computer, those are all things you need, but there's certain conveniences with owning things digitally. And I think that's the beauty of Bitcoin. You know, you can carry Bitcoin with you wherever you go, as long as you remember the C phrase and that in and of itself is a revolutionary technology. I, I just think of some of the, you know, Bitcoin millionaires out there, the fact that they can transport their wealth with them wherever they go, across borders, across customs, just by knowing their seed phrase in their head is truly incredible. Whereas with gold, to transport gold anywhere um, is a huge financial cost. <laughs> There's yeah. security risks that go with it. And so again, it's just one area where I think Bitcoin is in many ways a superior form of gold. Yeah. I think two things like the the argument of people who like gold where they say like Bitcoin is young. I think that's the weakest argument. It's not an irrelevant argument, but I think it's the weakest. So we, we already ended up at the weakest argument, right? Just because something is new doesn't mean it cannot be better, right? Like I think, I, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's just a weak argument. Yes, it's true. But, you know, look at all the other stuff. <laughs> Uh, as you just alluded to, you know, um, more transportable, all these things. Um, so I think it's interesting that we're already there. And I agree with you, like a lot, at least from my perspective, a lot of gold people are just like, yeah, I have gold. I'm just, yeah, I'm good, you know, but they forget that there's also competition in assets, competition in, in money, you know, and because Bitcoin is a digital money, it's more fierce competition and the adoption will go faster than, you know, any other physical alternative, right? If there would be any alternative, uh, basically. And, and what you said, I think, that, you know, for millennials, and I think this is one of the points that I'd love to reiterate on. We grew up with, you know, LimeWire, Kaza, you know, like uh, Napster, all these things like Everything on the internet, anything that's digital can be created and copied infinitely, okay? And so if there's a technology that makes something that's digital finitely scarce, you have to pay attention because that is the 
that is the invention, right? That is the discovery. That that is not possible with any other digital thing. So the fact that it is possible here and that even, you know, and I find this still hard to explain, but this is a digital thing, but it's almost tangible, right? Like you can write down letters and numbers with a pen on the paper and that can represent, that information can represent a billion dollar asset, you know? So it makes it makes it tangible. I love what Jack Mahler says about, you know, the information is the asset. Um, and that that is really what Bitcoin is. And I think, I don't know how you look at that. I'd love to hear, but that is one of the most important things I think to make, to just show like that is the innovation. The fact that you cannot just copy this endlessly. That's the entire point. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, Bitcoin was really the first invention to even introduce the whole idea of digital scarcity. And that in and of itself, in my opinion, is a multi-trillion dollar idea. And I think we'll see Bitcoin achieve a multi-trillion dollar market cap over time because that's how much value is behind such a revolutionary concept. Uh, the idea too of digital versus analog makes me think again of the Netflix versus Blockbuster analogy. So um, comparing gold to Blockbuster, Blockbuster, I, I figure most of your audience is millennials and maybe some Gen Z. And so maybe even some Gen Z remember what Blockbuster was. Lots of boomers too, those, actually. <laughs> yeah, lots. Okay, lots of so boomers. They know, so, they know Blockbuster. Right, right. So, so of course, with Blockbuster, people would go to a physical video store. They would rent a physical um, video cassette or DVD and they would take it home with them and they would you know, put it into their VCR and, and things would play. And it was all physical, it was all analog. Then Netflix came along and introduced a new concept of uh, mailing DVDs and video cassettes to people. And eventually Netflix went straight to digital and it became a streaming service. And the whole time Blockbusters thought, oh, this is just an upstart company. You know, we don't have to worry about this. But the second Netflix went all digital, it was game over for Blockbuster. And that I think is the genius behind Bitcoin itself. It takes the business model or um, essentially the economic value of gold and it makes it digital in a way uh, that no other invention has before. And it achieves what you were describing, Brom, that digital scarcity, which is so important um, in a world of digital abundance, right? If you can make something that is truly digitally scarce, that can't be replicated, like Kazaa uh, and Napster and songs, that we would listen to growing up, um, that in and of itself really changes the game and allows there to be a currency of the internet that has the potential to change not only how we transact on the internet, but as we transact as human beings. I like to think of uh, money as sort of the layer zero of humanity. And currently that layer zero is fiat currency. And I think that begets a lot of the problems that we're seeing in the world um, with fiat or with inflation. And that has trickle down effects that really affect uh, every corner of our society. But if you can change that layer zero to some kind of currency that is hard, that gives people the ability to save over time, you're essentially swapping out the layer zero of humanity, which could change the way human civilization itself operates. And that is the promise of Bitcoin. And one of the reasons why I love working in this industry, because if we can really make true on that promise, if we can bring about a world where currency is hard again, and it is cannot be manipulated by central bankers or politicians who are trying to sell the future of uh, their children to people here in the present, then that can really change the way things work in the United States and Europe, really all across the world. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, it, it, it is the base layer. And, and if we can create a transparent on unchangeable base layer, then anything that's built on top of that has to adhere to those principles, right? Uh, and that's why, yeah, I like to talk about the alignment of incentives where now uh, we touched on this in the beginning, right? Like fiat money creates bad incentives. So no one is really invited, you know, to actually deliver value or to make things better and better and better, right? It's kind of like we are going back in time, like the bread is more expensive than 50 years ago. and nutritionally probably also <laughs> worse you know um where we probably should have been in a place where the bread is free and no one is hungry you know um and so i think i also think we can get there if we have bitcoin as that 
as that base layer. But, you know, I do you think other people in other countries, other leaders in other countries think about this too? Like, it, it just makes so much sense for me that I'm kind of like surprised that no, I always kind of say like serious country followed El Salvador, like a big enough, powerful enough uh, country. What are your thoughts on that? Like, are there... Are there any countries that are going to react to this, you know, reserve asset strategy before the U.S. election? Is anything going to pop off in the, in the global game theory perspective? Yeah. If I were a discerning policymaker in a country outside the US, United States that had the means, I would actually try to front run this. Because <laughs> uh, if Donald Trump is elected, right. people are already talking about the, the Trump pump, you know, and... A lot of people are speculating that the reason why Bitcoin hasn't taken off yet is because investors are still not certain that Donald Trump will be president. Um, they seem to have a sense that if he is president, that completely changes the game for Bitcoin. Uh, all of a sudden, Bitcoin policy moves from a defensive stature to an offensive stature, where we have uh, a president in the White House who not only supports our industry, but a vice president who owns more than a quarter million dollars worth of Bitcoin. Um, so that changes the game. And if I honestly, if I were, say, a central banker in Europe or Asia or just a wise policymaker, I'd recognize that the next six months between now and a potential Donald Trump presidency um, are a great opportunity to start stacking stats for my country <laughs> to get ahead of the potential of a Trump pump or yeah. the potential of the United States just running away um, from the field by accumulating so much Bitcoin. I mean, the United States already has a big leg up over other countries just because it sees so much Bitcoin from illicit actors over the years. But uh, I, I would, if I had the means as a central banker in another country, uh, I think that this could be a prime opportunity to start accumulating my own strategic Bitcoin reserve. Um, whether or not that will happen, uh, I'm a little skeptical just because, again, we, we've been pushing hard on the Overton window and you can feel when you're opening the Overton window up more and more, there's a lot of resistance there. And a lot of traditional economists um, just online last week, I went to toe to toe with a number of different guys uh, who are more from fiat world who didn't really grasp this idea. And um, because of that alone, uh, I think we might not see something in the next six months, but over the next couple of years, uh, especially if we get a Donald Trump presidency, I do think you'll start to see this nation state game theory start to play out in real time. It'll be really fascinating to watch. Yeah. Did you get caught up in the discussion with the guy who started talking about the divisibility of a pizza or? No, um, I got caught up in a discussion with George Selgin. He's an economist at the Cato Institute and he just didn't like the idea of Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset. And honestly, I don't know if he was trying to engagement farm <laughs> or if he genuinely held those beliefs. I think he genuinely held those beliefs, but uh, I was just making the case for Bitcoin as, as a strategic reserve. And uh, he was making the argument that, oh, this is just something that Bitcoiners want to pump their own bags, which, I mean, you're not saying anything profound if you're pointing out the fact that, yeah, Bitcoiners will obviously benefit from nation state adoption, but my argument is that nation states themselves will benefit as well because they improve um, their own strategic reserves and they give themselves potentially a lifeboat if the if hyperinflation were ever to take place. And I, just at the end of the day, Bitcoin is the scarcest monetary asset in the world. And if you're a developing country who believes that tech is the future, why wouldn't you accumulate at least a little bit of the Bitcoin supply? It just seems to make logical sense. Yeah. Dude, that argument of um, you just talk about it to pump your own bags, I think is in the same category as the other one. Like it's it's the weakest of, ar of arguments. You know, there's, there's a sailor said this years ago, right? There are no informed critiques, but I don't see a lot of honestly informed critiques like with, with substance, right? Talking about, you know, fixed monetary policy is a bad thing or something, right? Or a fixed supply is a bad thing or, you know, and then, explain it however you want. Right. But it's always like, you know, similar to what you said, like you're only talking about it because you want to pump your own bags. And I always think like, you know, what would be weird if I would advocate for this and not own anything that would be even worse, you know? So it's yeah. just, I don't know, it's nonsense, but I, 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 it's so interesting that these people from, from this, 
other paradigm, you know, the, the, the Keynesian economics, that they are so emotional, you know, and also clueless in sometimes. I mean, I refer to the pizza guy. There was another discussion where the guy was like, yeah, but if you, you can divide any Bitcoin in a hundred million um, subunits, right? And so if you do that with a pizza, there's like infinite pizza. And then everyone, like lots of people <laughs> quote posted that because they were like, huh? but we heard this reply a few months ago. I don't, I don't know the name of the woman who said it, but it's like, okay, so we bake one pizza and then we have infinite pizza for everyone. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? It's also, it's, it's just such, the arguments are so weak. I'm really, you know, I've been in Bitcoin for 10 years. I'm looking for substantiated arguments. There's just not that many. There are some, you know, about potential future security, the block subsidy, all these things, um, which I think are legit, but they are far away, right? They, you can anticipate on, on handling them. And I think they are already clear now, but all the short-term uh, proponents, you know, proponent arguments are just, I don't know, weak. Yeah, they're weak and the arguments are old and recycled and stale at this point. I mean, how many times are we going to see the pizza analogy used over and over? Yeah, 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 yeah. By people, usually from the traditional financial world, who think that they've you know found some new information that Bitcoiners have never considered. <laughs> I think that in and of itself is a tell that they don't think highly of the Bitcoin community. That they think that after you know more than a decade of existence, Bitcoiners themselves had never even considered what they think is a novel idea that will forever put to rest the idea of Bitcoin. It's like, no, we've, that's been considered over and over again. And yeah, yeah, sometimes I do. I like you, Brahm. I wish that we had a uh, stronger critics. You know, we've, I, we've got some strong ones out there, but I also think that the more you understand Bitcoin, the more you believe in it. I've met very few people, if anyone, now that I really think about it, who actually understands Bitcoin, who doesn't also believe in it. Exactly. Um, I but, think a lot of the people who are against it. belief comes from the study, right? And it's not belief it, from right. someone else telling you you should believe it, right? Anyone listening to us, you sh should not listen to, <laughs> to what we think or say about this. You have to verify this and study yourself. That's the difference, no? Right. Yeah. Yeah, which I think speaks to the very idea of Bitcoin as a, a form of self-sovereignty, you know, mm -hmm. to understand Bitcoin you as an individual have to take it upon yourself to understand it, to get educated. It's, I think Bitcoin is all about responsibility at the end of the day, whether it's owning your own asset or taking the initiative on your own to truly understand what it's all about, which is something that's always drawn me to the world of Bitcoin, this idea that um, it's Bitcoin is responsibility at the end of the day. And I think responsibility is a path to freedom. Um, in a lot of our modern societies today, you have people who simply don't want responsibility. They want to defer to the government. They want mm -hmm. you know, social programs to take care of them. They want the universal basic income check in the mail. And at every stage, these people are refusing to take responsibility for their own lives. But Bitcoin offers a radical alternative where it offers people the opportunity to take extreme responsibility by being their own bank. And that can be intimidating to a lot of people, which is understandable. But at the same yeah. time, I think in a, in a world that um, negates or runs away from responsibility at every turn, we need something that is a counter to that. And that's what Bitcoin represents. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. I, I have another takeaway of, you know, these announcements at the conference. What I thought was interesting, because I tweeted like, okay, this was like a three out of 10 speech. And then uh, some people pointed me to, okay, you know, we are, we are in a bubble. This is actually, and uh, you know, we just talked about it. I think it's the vibe shift. It's the signal. It's, 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 it's making the Overton window um, bigger, right? That's the entire, entire point. So I think outside of our bubble, it, it, it was a 10, 10 speech, although it was incoherent as hell, but still, <laughs> you know, good, good speech, but we didn't see Bitcoin is legal tender. We didn't hear currency inflation, you know, printing our own currency to acquire more Bitcoin. We didn't hear about free energy for Bitcoin miners to incentivize hash rate. We didn't hear about Bitcoin bonds or asking uh, to be paid, uh, paid in Bitcoin for commodities. So, you know, these are all the things I think we, we, we think would make sense eventually, but this is just where we're at, right? Like it's, 
we're moving forward. The vibe is shifting, but we're still so, so, so early. Yeah, agreed. And it was funny to see the reaction both among people in the conference and people on Twitter about the speech because I wear two hats. You know, I wear one hat as a Bitcoiner and I wear another hat as a policy and political professional. And my hat as a policy and political professional told me, like you said, it was a 10 out of 10 speech from that perspective. Um, he hit on everything that Bitcoiners realistically could have asked for. Of course, there are the other things that point, you mentioned, yeah. you know, Bitcoin bonds um, and those other policy initiatives. But you can only open the Overton window so much <laughs> without yeah. people wanting to jam it shut in your face. And I think that's what we successfully did last Saturday was uh, we opened up the Overton window pretty significantly uh, that starts to normalize the idea of Bitcoin on the nation's balance sheet for people on the right and the left. And it's a step-by-step -step iterative process that will take some time. But, you know, as we start to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet, then that opens up the door to other discussions such as Bitcoin bonds, uh, Bitcoin as legal tender. Uh, these yeah. things take time and they can't all be done at once. And uh, for people who were dissatisfied with the speech in any way, I would just encourage them to look at it from that perspective, recognize that uh, we can't, you know, <laughs> Donald Trump can't do everything all at once. And this represents uh, a huge pendulum swing from where he was just a year ago, really, or just, you know, five years ago when he said that Bitcoin is a scam. <laughs> and now he recognizes, oh, Bitcoin is not a scam. In fact, it yep. is potentially an instrument of economic statecraft. And orange pilling for everybody takes time. And the fact that you have orange man embracing the orange coin, I think is really promising for all of us. Yeah. So what do you think is, is more important, legal tender first or the strategic reserve asset first? I think the strategic reserve first. Um, legal tender, there are, of course, Bitcoin scaling issues, which I think that we need to get our stuff together a little bit more on the technical side with the Lightning Network uh, before a nation can feasibly adopt it as legal tender. So I think that needs to happen first. And making Bitcoin a strategic reserve asset really gives us more time to work things out on the technical side, where making it legal tender that's actually used frequently day in and day out um, becomes more feasible a few years down the road if, if a country wanted to go that route. Yeah. And what do you think of, could Bitcoin be a single issue voting subject? I mean, it's, it's on the, at least, you know, in the States, it's on the platform of the Republicans. We see the Democrats, you know, react or at least, you know, they, they try, but yeah. Do you think it could be like a single issue voting subject for, for people? Or maybe if you look at other countries where there are systems with, for example, more uh, more parties, right? If there would be like a new party that says, you know, my only goal is for my country to start a strategic Bitcoin reserve. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think Bitcoin for potentially millions of Americans is a single issue, issue voting subject. I did some research earlier in the year just about how many people own Bitcoin and digital assets and how many people essentially turned the election in 2020 in favor of Joe Biden. So just to get it a little bit more granular about politics here in the United States, President Biden, he won the election in 2020 by really just tens of thousands of votes. It was just, uh, you know, tens of thousands of votes in key swing states that handed him the election. So there have been um, really interesting polls out there that show in those exact same swing states, there are millions of voters who say that Bitcoin and digital assets for them is a make or break issue at the polls. And so that's what Donald Trump and before him Vivek Ramaswamy and RFK intuited from the very beginning was that this is a demographic that is just waiting for representation that has nobody truly speaking for them uh, in the United States Congress or in the White House right now. And so as a discerning political entrepreneur, he recognized this, <laughs> this voting demographic could actually swing the election. Um, that's why you also see the emergence of what's called the Bitcoin Voter Project. So the Bitcoin Voter Project uh, is an organization here in the U.S. that is catalyzing that voting block um, and really helping it receive 
political consciousness, achieve political consciousness in a way where they can have an effect at the polls. So I think definitely here in the United States, the Bitcoin voter will be among the most powerful voting blocks in the country going forward. And I think that trend is only likely to extend to other countries as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting um, development in the sense that, as you, as you said, you know, people want to be heard. They are into this thing. They understand what it is or, you know, to a certain degree. And yeah, they, they need representation. I think, you know, if, I don't know how many people, I think that's an interesting question, by the way, in general, like how many people, um, fully understand Bitcoin. Well, you never can fully understand it. Right. But let's say to the level at, at where we are talking about, um, eventually that will be more people. And because that rabbit hole is so deep and touches all these different dimensions, they can smell out the bullshit about these dimensions from, you know, whatever party, political parties there are in their uh, country, right? So I think actually it will become more difficult for people who fully understand Bitcoin to vote, to vote for anyone who doesn't understand it. I agree. I agree. And this goes back to our discussion earlier about what is the future of Bitcoin as a partisan issue in the United States? I think the future is bipartisan for that exact reason. Uh, more and more, you're going to see people incorporate Bitcoin as a part of their financial portfolio in the same way that gold and bonds yeah, exactly. is a fixture of people's financial portfolios today. And, you know, imagine if you had a politician out there who was trying to crack down on gold or trying to crack down on bonds or trying to make it illegal for people to own, you know, a certain percentage of U.S. equities. Yes. <laughs> he would Very be good point. Committing Very political point. suicide. Yes. Yeah. And at, at that point, that that is the future. I think as Bitcoin becomes a fixture of financial portfolios, it will have to be bipartisan. And any politician who wars against it, like Elizabeth Warren, is just shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. Well, it is that right. They have to. You know, I I, I like it that also, you know, some critics say like, oh, um, Bitcoin goes to the right or, you know, whatever, because Trump endorses it, but it's the other way around. They have to come to Bitcoin. I think exactly, you know, it's, it's one of the top reasons, the one you just mentioned, it's, it's, it's going to be a more important part of the portfolio of more people. So yeah, it, it, if an anti-Bitcoin politician is talking uh, to you, then you're just going to ignore them and not listen to anything else that they are saying. Right. So they have to come to Bitcoin and Bitcoin is for anyone again, you know, as we, as we mentioned. Um, so I, I also see it as, you know, uh, yeah, just politicians bending the knee in a sense that this is, uh, this is definitely here to stay. That's, that's kind yeah. of like the, the conclusion, I think. Mm. I agree. I, I think Bitcoin right now is coded right, but I think that's temporary for all the reasons that you just, just mentioned. Uh, you know, we saw after the Bitcoin conference, some people complained that it was majority Republicans who spoke. And my response to that is, well, you can get Democrat friends on board too, but they really haven't been coming around to this idea. But pretty soon they will be forced to because Bitcoin will be ubiquitous. Uh, so many people will own it on the right and the left. Even now, according to Coinbase's own, own data, there's actually more people on the left who own Bitcoin mm. uh, than people on the right more Democrats own it than Republicans. I think Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler dismissed the memo on that one. Yeah, which I think with Gensler is just interesting. I watched his lecture, the MIT lecture, which I think was great. So I don't know, something something was promised to him perhaps for for, for him to behave like, like he's behaving, you know, may, maybe a future treasury position or, some, or something like that. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. Do you, do you think that because they have to come to Bitcoin and they also I think in a sense, Bitcoin is also somewhat of an equalizer, right? Like you can be like, oh, I'm pro Bitcoin, but you know, like I see Trump saying I'm pro Bitcoin, but I, d I don't think he actually understands it. You know, maybe he, he, as you know, the individual person, he does not necessarily have to understand it as long as the people around him, you know, who are helping create the policies actually uh, understand that, you know, may maybe this is going to be like one one of the topics that is going to 
yeah, kind of show what the politicians and the policymakers are are made of. Just because Bitcoin is so transparent and you can verify uh, anything, right? It's it's there. There's nothing obscure about it, in my opinion. So it's either when you say like I'm pro Bitcoin, you have to yeah do the work, walk the talk, right? You cannot be pro Bitcoin on paper. You have to actually do something with it or about it. Yeah, that's true. I I am very bullish though on Donald Trump um, embracing Bitcoin fully, not only because of his public statements, but because of those in his inner circle. So Vivek Ramaswamy is beloved by Donald Trump, <laughs> which is fascinating because Vivek himself is a, a a very charismatic personality, and you know one might think that. Uh, a charismatic person might see another charismatic person as someone they don't want to compete with and someone that they would yep. try to shut out, but it's been quite the opposite. And so it was actually Vivek that um, heavily influenced Donald Trump to first oppose CBDCs. And I think that was the gateway drug to Donald Trump accepting Bitcoin. But even outside of Vivek, uh, you have Baron Trump. <laughs> I don't think people talk about Baron enough. Baron is the six foot seven youngest son of Donald Trump. And he is very pro crypto um, and very much uh, supportive of digital assets from uh, from what it appears from some of the activity we see on Twitter. Uh, and then you have Air, uh, Donald Trump Jr., who, when we were at the Bitcoin conference, he was actually there with C Carl Tuckerson um, doing events that were adjacent to Bitcoin. So you have a lot of people in Trump's inner circle who really seem to embrace Bitcoin and digital assets and um, are very supportive of the idea. And so Donald Trump himself, he gets maligned in the media and oftentimes portrayed as someone who's not intelligent. But I mean, for anyone who knows, the guy is sharp. He's hilarious. And he has the shtick of a professional wrestling promoter. And I think people see that sometimes and dismiss the fact that he has created a multi-billion dollar business. He is a savant level marketer and he understands business and finance. And so, uh, you know, does he understand... Bitcoin like Alex Gladstein does or Safety and Amos or Pierre Richard does? No, probably not because he's got a lot of other pressing issues on his mind. But I do think that Donald Trump, if he is not uh, completely orange-pilled at this point, it's just a matter of time before he recognizes uh, the value of yeah. Bitcoin to investors across the world. So um, I think that he will. he is in the process of being orange-pilled, not only for political reasons, but um, for authentic reasons as well in the near future. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thinking about hearing him say, you know, our stack is huge. <laughs> Yours is tiny <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Something like that. But yeah, oh, you said Carl, Carl Tuckerson. I thought it was funny. Tucker Carlson. Yeah. But oh, no. Tucker Carlson. <laughs> anyway, yeah. anyway. No, no, but I, I, I like what you said. I think, you know, I think Trump is a very polarizing figure. I still don't know what I think of him. But yeah, as you said, he is from the Ric Flair era also, right? He looks like a WWE spokesperson. Um, but yeah, eventually I think if this election can open up that Overton window enough, you have the Democrats uh, adopting, quote unquote, adopting it, you know, eventually not not following up with any promises or doing a complete 180, I think at this point would be kind of like a career suicide. Um, so even if the Democrats would adopt Bitcoin now, perhaps if they win the election, turning around and, and not doing anything that, they are perhaps going to promise, I think, is it is going to be a very bad look, right? So in 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 that sense, we are already pretty far in the terms of, uh, well, let's stick with the vibe shift. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. And one thing that stuck out in Trump's speech was when he said that he would fire Gary Gensler on day one and the whole crowd got off their feet and... Yeah just erupted in in applause and then donald trump said wow i didn't realize he was that unpopular and said let's do this again i will fire gary gensler yeah, yeah, yeah. on day one and everyone got up again and started clapping you know uh, that it's hard to underscore just how unprecedented it is in american politics to have an sec chair who is that political who has brought so much uh just agony and pain to the industry like gary gensler has and so even if 
there were to be a Kamala Harris presidency, I wonder if Gary Gensler's political days are numbered because the SEC chair of an administration should be one of the most anodyne, inoffensive appointments out there. But the fact that he might be a political liability to Kamala Harris at this point is something that Democrats are paying attention to. And he is clearly out over his skis. He miscalculated here, as did Elizabeth Warren. And there could be real repercussions for that, um, whether or not he would stay in a future Democratic administration, I think is in question just because he's become such a political burden to the current administration. Yeah. It also made me think uh, of a tweet. I think it was from Eric uh, Balkunis or, or James Safar, you know, the guys from B- Bloomberg who reported on the Bitcoin ETF um, uh, launches. And one of them tweeted like, I've never seen any crowd or group of people follow the launch of an ETF this closely. You know, like I think they both gained hundreds of thousands of followers, right, by by their reporting. And I think, you know, this, this Gensler example is the same. They're, th- th- this is a very informed crowd, you know, way more informed than lots of other people on other issues, you know, and so... I, I just find that just really interesting. You saw Trump's face where he was like, what? Like, is this, this is a thing? <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. going to say it again, but I think, I think that's also um, a really interesting signal just from B- Bitcoin, you know, the, the, the Bitcoin adopters in general, like how up to date they are with what's going on and that they have insights on it and opinions on it. And they're not afraid to, to share them. So you know, in the same way that perhaps Bitcoin could be an accountability tool for fiat money. It's kind of the same as like Bitcoiners could be an accountability tool for for the politicians. Uh I think I think those two examples are kind of uh kind of kind of show that. Yeah. Um I I still wanted to ask you kind of a different subject, but you mentioned you were also a millennial. I'd love to know how you experience talking to our fellow millennials. Uh, about Bitcoin? Yeah, different reactions depending on where they are politically. Um, When I talk to Democrats who are our age about Bitcoin, the automatic response that has been programmed into their brains by Elizabeth Warren is, oh, isn't it terrible for the environment? And at that point, I mean, I could go on and on uh, about actually the environmental benefits of Bitcoin mining but whenever I'm in a social situation, I try, <laughs> I try not to talk about Bitcoin because it's so hard for me to stop talking about it. But <laughs> it gives me an opportunity to really change their minds on the subject. Um, so just real quickly on that. So I work for Riot Platforms, uh, a Bitcoin miner. And what a lot of people don't recognize is that Bitcoin miners actually allow clean energy projects to be bootstrapped because renewable energy oftentimes can't find a buyer because oftentimes the sun is shining during hours of the day where no one needs energy or the wind is blowing at certain hours of the day where no one needs energy and oftentimes that energy goes to waste. But Bitcoin miners completely change the equation where we can always use energy and we'll always buy energy if it's cheap and if it's abundant. And so in that sense, Bitcoin mining actually makes a lot of clean energy projects, not only in the US, but in developing regions like Africa it makes these projects economically viable in a way that they wouldn't be without Bitcoin mining. So that's an interesting way to sort of subvert their understanding of what Bitcoin is. Um, You know, when I talk to people who identify as Republican, there's a heavy libertarian strain in the United States that even if they don't own Bitcoin, they like the idea of it, right? It reminds me of that scene from Zoolander um, (laughs) when he says, I like Sting's music. I've never really listened to it, but I like the fact that he's making it. (laughs) I think that's how... (laughs) A lot of people um, who are libertarian in the U.S. feel about Bitcoin. They might not own it themselves, but they love the idea that there's a form of money out there uh, that puts a check on federal money printing and allows people to be uh, their own bank. And so I get different reactions uh, depending on where people stand on on which side of the aisle they're on. You know, it's a lot harder talking to boomers about Bitcoin. It's just so hard for them to wrap their minds around just because they've lived in fiat currency world for so long. But millennials and Gen Z, Gen Z seems to get it just right off the bat. Um, They seem to be even more digitally native than us. And so grasping the concepts behind Bitcoin is uh, appears to be much less challenging for them. 
Yeah, what do you, what do you think is the main thing that holds millennials back? Like, of course, you know, this is called Bitcoin for millennials. I think, you know, we are going to be in power. We are going to inherit, you know, if there is any, you know, from our parents, this is the great wealth transfer. We never were taught what is money. We are participating in, you know, this investing game that we can never win again. Everything we think about with regards to, you know, the, the path of your life from, you know, going to college, buying a house, starting a family, and like, et cetera, all these things. It was true for our parents, but it's not necessarily true for us anymore, right? There's so many clear things, at least to me, that I think millennials should be aware about. What What's like one of these things that, that you come across a lot or, or is like a, a big talking point for you also with regards to, to Bitcoin? In just helping people understand Bitcoin? Yeah, or like why should you study this, right? Like for me, it's... Mm this is the most important thing you should spend your time on, at least study. You should also spend time on other things, but you know, this is the most important technological discovery you should study. I think, you know, when I talk yeah. to millennials, but they don't always get that. Uh, yeah. And I was just wondering what, what do you think is like the main thing holding them back or, or what they should learn about? Yeah. I think the main thing holding them back is maybe some of the cultural stigma around Bitcoin bros or crypto bros um, that needs to be dismantled because those Bitcoin bros are are doing well for themselves. You know, a lot of them are. And so um, I think more people are becoming more sympathetic to the idea of Bitcoin because millennials are recognizing everything that you just mentioned, that it's so much harder for us to buy a house. It seems to be so much harder for us to save. It seems to be so much harder for us to just achieve those life milestones that seem to come very easily for our parents, right? And the wisest among our generation are looking for the why behind that. They're trying to dig deeper. And when they do, they recognize that the problem, at least that we're facing uh, most acutely right now, the problem is inflation, right? And yeah. when you recognize that the problem is inflation, you look for root causes. And when you find the root causes, you find two things, Federal Reserve and the US Congress with the common factor being either money printing or reckless spending. And at that point, people are more open to the idea of Bitcoin than ever before, which makes me very bullish on our generation when it comes to Bitcoin adoption, because we're all looking for some kind of refuge against inflation. Historically, yeah. that refuge has been only a home, but home ownership is so hard for people our age that they're turning to alternative sources. and I, in my opinion, one of the best sources could be Bitcoin, uh, just given its price performance since its inception and where it appears to be heading from here. Yeah, yeah, great point. I, I, I definitely agree. I wanted to ask you two last questions. The first one is to circle back to how you discovered Bitcoin, uh, watching or first heard about it, you know, watching Conan O'Brien. And I think you said, well, they were making a joke about it. So the joke, you know, must have been legit or true. You know, Bitcoin uh, is not something to pay attention to. But you also mentioned, you know, Bitcoin really changed your your views in some ways or your worldview. How do you look back at kind of like believing what the TV said and not paying attention to kind of like how you look at the world now? Yeah. So I can't remember the specific joke that I heard on Conan O'Brien, but the the theme of the joke was that they were portraying Bitcoin as internet funny money, just kind of this magical invention made by computer nerds that uh, didn't have any underlying value, which makes sense that um, t TV often maligns Bitcoin when Bitcoin is down bad. I actually see, you know, uh, yeah. news companies and uh, publications like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal uh, bagging on Bitcoin as a good bottom signal. It's probably a sign that, you know, the bear market is far advanced. And if mainstream media is picking up on the fact that, you know, Bitcoin's doing bad, it is probably a good sign that the reversal is approaching. Um, so that was my first introduction to Bitcoin and how it changed my views on society. Bitcoin in a healthy way, I think just makes you more skeptical of everything. Uh, people who live in fiat world 
are also very prone to fiat news. And by fiat news, I mean essentially fake news. Uh, I mean corporate media that has a very clear agenda to pad their own pockets. And so they'll push out narratives that are good for their bottom line, but possibly not good for society as a whole. And when you realize that fiat currency has much in common with fiat news, it just makes you more skeptical of everything. And so uh, in a healthy way, I think Bitcoin made me question more. It made me more skeptical, but it also encouraged me to do my own investigations and just not to take things at face value. But when I see a, a headline that seems suspicious to me or the vibe seems off, to do a little bit more digging on my own in the same way that when people recognize that their savings are eroding with time, they try to do a little bit more digging and they recognize that there's actually a cause behind that. And it's our monetary policy in the United States in large part. Um, and so in the same way that Bitcoin encourages you to dig deeper on money, I think it helps people who embrace the idea of Bitcoin to take that same model and dig deeper in all areas of life, you know, whether it be news, politics, um, wherever it may be, it just it encourages people to take more responsibility for their life and not to be programmed by um, institutions that are bigger than them and might not have their best interests at heart. Yeah, you just gave me a thought and I tweeted it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but it's like Bitcoin enhances your optimism and makes you skeptical of anything that threatens that optimism. That's what, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that made me think. And which is yeah. mostly coming from the fiat money world, right? Right. That's just it. Right. Because who wouldn't want to build stuff and contribute to stuff, right? Like just th th this is one of my biggest insights. It's like, do you want to be a consumer or a builder, like a contributor, right? Like, do you want to, yeah. Do you want to do things or, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, 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 maybe it's a red, blue pill choice kind of matrix thing, right? Like, do, do I want to, yeah, as you said, like take ownership try to be more sovereign to whatever degree is is good for you right but at least stop outsourcing lots of responsibilities like you do now that is like peak fiat money world so start thinking for yourself start doing things that you know you find valuable and contribute to well basically anything but just stop consuming so yeah something like that but yeah it's fun Oh man, I love how uh, this is also, you know, one of my motivations for the podcast is just like uh, talking to so many different Bitcoiners also helps me, you know, um, further structure my own thoughts around this. So thanks for, thanks for the inspiration. <laughs> um, yeah, bro, this is great. It's fun. Yeah. Okay. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief you will never let go? Uh, that absolute truth exists. Um, and I think that's a core belief of Bitcoin as well. Fiat world is supported by money printing, is supported by um, central bankers and politicians who are willing to mortgage the future of generations that come after them for greedy people in the present. And people are waking up to the fact that there's so much of fiat world that is fake and that is not real. And I believe in absolute truth. And that's what I love about Bitcoin is the absolute truth is laid out there for everyone to see on the digital ledger that is Bitcoin. Um, just a quick anecdote with that. I, this was a real wake up moment for me when I was, when I was in Princeton, we were in a seminar and the professor asked, how many of you believe in absolute truth? There was a class of about 15 of us. It was only me and two other people in the room who raised our hands that uh, there is such thing as capital T truth. And that was the biggest shocker to me because, you know, here you supposedly have the future leaders of our country who think that, you know, truth is fungible or truth can be molded or truth is scarce or sorry, that truth is um, manufactured by humans. And uh, I think, you know, there's danger to saying absolute truth extends across all, all categories, but I firmly believe that absolute truth exists and that we need a kind of money that is undergirded by the idea of absolute truth. So that's one of my core beliefs that um, that I can't be shaken from. Just my own life experience, I've seen, okay, there's capital, capital T truth out there and 
we need to do our best to align ourselves um, in our lives to that truth. I think it will not surprise you that I fully agree. I think that is also one of my biggest realizations that whatever you think of Bitcoin, your opinion about its applications and stuff like that, you cannot deny that Bitcoin is absolute engineered truth because it's just a thing, you know, it's, it's just a thing that works as intended, you know, and uh, as intended is what the rules of the protocol are and enough people are still following that. And whatever comes out of that is the truth coming from that system. And that, that is, I think, one of the also main characteristics and main points of Bitcoin is this is the truth and you cannot change it. And therefore it has value. Uh, and it's guarded by the most, <laughs> you know, the strongest computer network in the world. So, yeah, I think uh, we could start a whole rabbit hole journey from that but i love i love that you shared that um yeah man i really enjoyed this conversation i want to thank you for your time i will make sure to link to you know your twitter x profile so people can follow you and your thoughts and your work and uh yeah man thanks again for the time i uh really enjoyed this yeah thank you Brown. this was great this is one of the the funnest bitcoin conversations i've had in a long time so appreciate it awesome man stay in touch cheers I hope you enjoyed this episode and if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.